Well, it is great to be here this morning. I, I missed being here last Sunday, and I missed being here on Wednesday, and it is so good to be back. I know it was only a week that I was out that I was sick. It's good to see you too, Jesse. Thank you. But it, it was only a week I was out, but it felt a lot longer than that. And so with that week having been out since I got sick on really Saturday, I had already planned to preach last Sunday, and so if you've noticed in your bulletin this morning, the sermon handout there is the same sermon handout from last Sunday. So that's not a mistake, that's because we're going to go ahead and do that lesson together this morning. And so we're going to look at that idea you can see on your handout of giving to the work. Now when we talk about giving, there are certainly many different places to which we could turn to talk about giving. Although it was not planned last, or this past Wednesday night, you were able to hear one of those lessons coming from Mark chapter 12 with the, the widow who gave her two mites. Also, you think about the great lessons that can be learned from Exodus chapter 35 and, and chapter 36 as Moses and all of the people are there and they give more than enough for the building of the tabernacle. But this morning, where our lesson is going to come from is from the place which Grayson read for us just a moment ago in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Because in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, what we find is this beautiful scene. We have a, a situation wherein David knows that the temple is going to be built by his son Solomon. Now previously, going back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, David was the one who originally wanted to build that temple, but he found out he was not the one, that it would be his son Solomon. And so in order to help his son Solomon out, in order to help get a leg up on that project, what we have in 1 Chronicles chapter 29 verses 1 through 20 is the preparations for giving to the building of the temple. And what we're going to find from this section together are some valuable lessons as it relates to our giving today. As Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in verses 1 and 2, we find that we have the command that we are to give on the first day of the week. Paul says there, 1 Corinthians 16, starting in verse 1, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, Paul says, So you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. That service of giving, in fact, we, we just did it a moment ago as we passed the plates around and, and gave back a portion of those blessings that God has given to us. But giving is important. And many times we do not consider the reason it is that we give back to our God. And so hopefully this morning, these are some things that we might be able to consider together. That as we give back to the work, we need to first of all appreciate the gravity of our giving. Brethren, giving is serious business. When you look in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, it's in verse 1. At the very beginning of this section, we find just how serious the giving is. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, my son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great. And notice this last part of verse 1. Because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. Everything that follows in this chapter, everything that follows in this lesson about giving, requires us to understand the seriousness of our giving. That as we give, yes, we are giving to works that, that are run by man. But more importantly, our works, our giving is going back to God. And so when we give, we need to make sure that we are giving of ourselves. You can keep going here down through verse 5 now. And picking up in verse 2. Now for the house of my God, I have prepared, prepared with all my might... Gold for things to be made of gold, silver for things of silver, bronze for things of bronze, iron for things of iron, wood for things of wood, onyx stones, stones to be set, glistening stones of various colors, all kinds of precious stones and marble slabs in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection on the house of my God, I have given to the house of my God 
over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver, 3,000 talents of gold of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver to overlay the walls of the houses, the gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver, and for all kinds of work to be done by the hands of craftsmen. Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? What we have in these first five verses is David emphasizing the fact that before he looked to anybody else, before he expected anything for the temple from anybody else, David first and foremost gave of himself. When we look through the verses that we've just read together, verse 2 tells us that David gave with all his might. David was willing to give with all his might, verse 3, because he had set his affection on the house of God. And brethren, when we come to give with all of our might, when our heart, when our affection, when our concerns and our interests are on the things of our God, that's going to change the way that we look at our giving. In fact, David says it's through this type of willful giving that we will set ourselves apart. Look again at the question that David asked in verse 5. Once again, after he is given of himself, David said, Who then is willing to consecrate himself this day to the Lord? That consecration, it was done through their giving. And we need to follow that model of David. In fact, it's the same model that would have been followed by the brethren in Macedonia in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 5, as Paul was there using the Macedonians as an example of their giving. And Paul said that they first gave themselves to the Lord, and then Paul said they gave to us. That before the giving was done anywhere else, the giving was first of all done by giving themselves to the Lord. The affections were where they needed to be. But as Christians, and even as Americans... Brethren, we have a unique responsibility. Many times when we talk about wealth and when we talk about being wealthy, we will kind of of shy away from it or, or sometimes we'll try to exclude ourselves from that conversation because we find ourselves looking and thinking about wealth within our nation. And we can look around and say, well, I'm not as wealthy as as so and so over here, or I don't make as much as so and so over here. But when we look at ourselves in comparison with the world as a whole, brethren, we are among the wealthiest that there are. And that comes with great responsibility. You think about the instruction that Paul would give to the wealthy brethren in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 18, Paul says, Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. That those who have great material blessings need to make sure that they are giving back just as much. That there is a great appreciation and understanding of where those blessings even have come from, and we'll consider that more as this lesson continues. But Paul says through our giving, this is serious business. Because as we give, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 19, that we are storing up for ourselves a good foundation. It's nothing that we are storing up for ourselves in this life, but we are storing up a great foundation for our eternal life. And as we give back to our God as we ought to, we can be sure that nothing is going to take away that treasure that we have laid up. Think about what Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. Jesus there says, Not to lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy or where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy nor where thieves break in and steal for where your treasure is. Jesus says, There your heart will be also. If our heart is in the right place, We will give as we ought to. We will give like those brethren in Macedonia. We will give just as David did in in 1 Chronicles 29 verses 1 through 5. And that will lead us to be able to rejoice in faithful giving. 
Yes, giving is serious business, but brethren, we can enjoy being able to give. Giving truly is a blessing. And we ought to be able to rejoice when we know that we have given to the best of our ability and that those around us have also given to the best of their ability. You think about what continues now in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 6 through 9. Then the leaders and the fathers of houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds, with the officers over the king's work, offered willingly... They gave for the work of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord into the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. And King David also rejoiced greatly. When we see this section, we see in verse 6 and verse 9 how it is that that it's really bookended with that idea of willing giving. That it was not just David, but it was the leaders. It was the people who were willingly giving to the work. And the reason that they willingly would give to the work is because of their faithfulness. Look again in verse 9. Because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord. Now this is an important lesson for us to consider. Because giving willingly has a direct correlation to our faith. That if our faith in God is what it ought to be, We will have no problem giving to Him as He desires for us to give. But if we struggle with it, if giving has become a chore for us, then perhaps our faith is not what it ought to be. Think about the desire that God has in our giving. That God's concern is not so much with the amount as it is with our heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, the instruction given is for each one to give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. That God's desire is for us to willingly, to gladly give back to Him. And it's in that giving that we will receive the greatest blessings. Remember the lesson that Jesus would teach as it's recorded in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. When it's recorded of Jesus to have said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Giving is serious business. It is certainly a a, 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 a work of great magnitude. But it's something that we are able to do. And what a great blessing that is. And that's what David continues in the Scripture that Grayson read for us just a little bit ago. This great section of praise to our God for the ability to give back to Him. In verses 10 through 12, what we're going to see is is the responsibility we have to recognize God as the ultimate giver. Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel. Our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. When we look at those verses, what is left out? Truly, God is the ultimate giver. He has provided us with all that we could ever need. He certainly is able to give even more than we could ever imagine. James chapter 1 and verse 17 tells us that every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. The idea that is given by James in that verse is that God is the ultimate giver. That He has given every good and every perfect thing. And that is His nature. He has always given greatly and He always will give greatly. 
We need to recognize that all that we have, all that we could possibly give, comes from God Himself. Now at times we can fall into a certain line of thinking. At times we might fool ourselves into believing that the more hours that we work, that the more time that we put in, the more income we receive, and, and we start to store it up for ourselves. And we start to think that, that this is what I have because I have worked so hard for it. This is what I have because of all that I have done. But we need to remember what we learned from the wise Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 in verse 19. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 19 where it says, As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, the wise Solomon says, This is the gift of God. Brethren, everything we have in this life, is not our own. There is nothing that is truly our own. But everything we have, all of our blessings come from God Himself. And when we realize that everything we have is truly God's, how can we not desire to give back to Him? We need to consider ourselves in light of His great blessings. Consider what David goes on to say in verses 13 through 15 of 1 Chronicles 29. Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. Think about what David has said here. David is thanking God for the blessing of being able to give back to him. Consider who David was. David was the anointed king of Israel. He is the man after God's own heart. He is the one who has been selected to lead God's people. And David says, Who am I? Who, who are my people? Who are these individuals, God, that you have chosen to be your own? Who are we that we can give so willingly as this? Brethren, when we come to see God for who He is, when we come to realize all that He has done for us, it's going to be reflected in our giving. It's going to motivate us to dig just a little bit deeper, to give just a little bit more. And in that giving, yes, it certainly includes our finances, but it's more than that. It includes ourselves. It includes our time. It includes our efforts. It includes our prayers. It includes giving everything we have back to our God. We need to see ourselves in light of Him. Because it's by God's grace that we have been given this blessed ability to give. Our brother Jim Hampton has written several books. And one of the books that he's written deals with this subject of giving. And in preparing for this sermon, I was flipping through that particular book that he wrote, and I came across a quote that really stood out to me. And I want to share that with you at this time as it relates to our giving. He says, How can a Christian spend God's money excessively in their personal luxuries and worldly pleasures while knowing what Jesus gave for their salvation? and turn their backs on the work that is to be done in Christ's kingdom that requires financial support. Let's let that sink in. That as we reflect on what God has done for us, as we reflect on God's love for us, and giving His only begotten Son so that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life, when we think about how much was given... For us, how could we not want to give everything that we have back to Him? An old preacher at one point was 
giving a, a, a lesson or talking about this subject of giving. And to illustrate the idea of how we should be willful and, and cheerful givers. He, he mentioned how it is that as the Lord's Supper is, is, is being observed, that as the bread is being passed through the pews, as, as the cup is being passed, that you think about the tears that may be shed. You think about the seriousness with which we reflect on the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. But then as soon as we have the prayer for our offering, and as soon as the offering trays come through, we, we find ourselves at times sunken and sullen, not wanting to let go of the check or of the cash, not realizing what it is that we are doing and what it is we are saying through our heart and through our attitude. Brethren, when we see who God is as the ultimate giver, and when we see ourselves in light of all that He has given to us, how can we not grow in our desire to give? In fact, Paul says that we are to grow in this grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, as Paul is, is there in that section about giving, he says in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 7, But as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. And understand in context what that grace Paul is speaking of is. He is speaking about the grace, the blessing we have to give to our God. Truly giving is a blessing. Yes, it's serious business, but it is a blessing that we are able to give back to Him. And when we give to our God, what we will find are great results. As this section concludes going through verse 20, we can see here the, the wonderful results of giving. But that begins with the challenge that we find in verses 16 and 17. David says, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. As David considered the giving that was done on that day, David realized that there was a challenge in that giving. David realized that giving is a test, that as David gave, that as the leaders gave, as the people gave, God was there trying their hearts. David said it was in his uprightness, in his integrity of heart that he gave back to God. We need to remember once again that giving is not all about the amount. Yes, if we have been blessed greatly, then that needs to be reflected in our giving. But God's concern is with the heart of our giving. That when we know that we have given back to God to the best of our ability, and when we can do so with great joy, our God is going to be pleased. We will have passed that test of the uprightness, of the integrity of our heart. But if that's not the case, then we will have failed that test. If our giving is not willful, if our giving is not cheerful, then we cannot pass that test of our giving. But even through our giving, there's another test. It's something that we do not find necessarily here in this section. But as we continue studying through the Bible, there's an, an interesting idea related to our giving. When you go to Malachi chapter 3, in Malachi chapter 3, there is a great indictment that is given. Malachi 3 and verse 8 and 9, we find that, that the priests, that the people had robbed God. That they robbed God through their offerings and their tithes, as the Scripture there says. But then God challenges the people. In Malachi 3 and verse 10, God challenges the people to give willingly, to give liberally. And God says He would open up the windows of the storehouses of heaven. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me here. I don't want you to leave today and say that Preston is preaching a, a prosperity gospel. 
By no means is that what I'm saying. But when we look in the Scriptures, we find that the more that we give, the more that we will receive. In fact, the law of sowing and reaping is clearly applied to the blessing of giving in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6, Paul says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Understand what Paul has said in these verses. The more we give, the more we receive. But the more we receive, it's not more for ourselves, but it's more to give back to every good work. Brethren, we have a great responsibility. By no means are we giving for any physical blessing or any physical benefit that we may gain from it. As Christians, our giving is done to lay up and store up that good foundation of eternal life as was spoken of in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 19. We are giving because we understand what God has given for us. And we understand that all that we have is for Him. And when we give back to the best of our ability, when we do so willingly and with all liberality, we're going to grow in our faith. We are going to grow in our devotion for our God. Consider the, the final verses here in this particular section. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you. And give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before the Lord and the king. David's prayer was that the willing and cheerful giving of that day would lead them on to a greater dedication and to a greater devotion to our God. The more that we pour our hearts into the great blessing we have to give, the more invested that we will become in the work of our Lord. This means that as we give back as a congregation, consider what it is we are pouring our hearts into. That when we give with all liberality, when we give willingly and cheerfully, we're pouring ourselves into the local work of this congregation. We're pouring ourselves into the Gospel Radio Network, into Camp Ida, into the Home of Recovery and Restoration. We are pouring ourselves into the various preaching schools and preaching students that we support, into the children's homes we support, into the various missions and missionaries that we support. This is what we are doing. This is what we are pouring ourselves into as we give back to our God in the right manner. But if our giving is not what it ought to be, if we are not giving with all liberality, if we're not doing so willfully, if our giving is not done cheerfully, consider what it is we are saying. We're saying that we do not care that we do not care about the local work of this congregation, that we do not care about the Gospel Radio Network or Camp Ida or the Home of Recovery and Restoration. We don't care about the preaching schools or the preaching students. We don't care about the children's homes. We don't care about the missions or the missionaries. Brethren, what we are saying, if that is our attitude, is that we do not care about the work of our Lord. And what a shame it would be if that is what we have said through our giving when we arrive on the day of judgment. Our giving to God is a reflection of our relationship to Him. That the more we come to know Him, the more we come to love Him, the more that we come to appreciate what He has done for us, the more willingly, 
the more cheerfully and the more liberally we will be willing to give back to Him. Giving is certainly a sacrifice. It's not easy to do. But when we stop and reflect on what it is that allows us to be able to give, when we think about the serious, uh, the serious nature of our giving, and we think about how much God has given to us and blessed us with so that we can in turn bless others, we think about the lasting nature that comes from that, that we grow in our faith, that we grow in our devotion and in our dedication to Him. Before we close, I want you to look again in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 16 through 20. This section that we have just looked at together, and, and I want you to stop for a moment and think about David. That as David looked back at the end of that day, as the willing and liberal giving was being done and as it was being counted up and, and moved to the storehouses. Think about how glad David was. Think about how he and all the people were able to rejoice. But now let's think about ourselves. Just a little bit ago, we were able to give back to our God. And as we reflect not on the giving of everybody else, but as we reflect on our own giving, can we rejoice like David? And if not, then we need to make a change this morning. We need to make sure that we take care of whatever it might be in our life so that we can once again give to God as He desires for us to. That we can grow in the service of our giving. That we can grow in our faith and in our dedication to Him. If there is room for improvement in your giving, won't you take the steps to correct it today? Won't you start by giving yourself to God, giving Him your life, giving Him your all, if you need to seek out the counsel of our elders, they are here to help. That if you need help with budgeting, if you need help trying to determine what you need to do, seek out their counsel. They're here to help you. And if you need to make things right with God, why would you wait? Knowing everything that He has done for you, won't you give yourself to Him today? And won't you let it be known as we stand and as we sing?